This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, my name is Andrew Reinhardt. I'm the Director of Publications for the ANS, and welcome to Long Table number 105. And it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome Dr. Walid Ziad today. Um, Dr. Ziad is an assistant professor and Ali Jarahi Fellow in Persian Studies at the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, formerly a research fellow at the Abdallah S. Camel Center at the study, for the study of Islamic law and civilization at Yale Law School. Uh, Ziad's conducted field work in over, count them, 120 towns across Afghanistan, uh, Uzbekistan, and Pakistan. Um, he's the author of Hidden Caliphate, Sufi Saints Beyond the Oxus and Indus. Uh, that was published by Harvard University Press last year. And the forthcoming monograph, Beyond Kutba and Sika, uh, Sovereignty, uh, Sovereignty and uh, Coinage in Sindh, 1300 to 1700. He received his bachelor's, his MA and MPhil, and PhD from Yale University, where the, his dissertation was awarded at the university, was awarded the university-wide Theron Rockwell Field Prize, which is one of the two most prestigious Yale dissertation awards across all disciplines. And for today's, for today's long table, Professor Ziad will be talking about the subject of his latest book, In the Treasure Room of the Sacra King, Vote of Coinage from Gondaran Shrines, which was published uh, this month by the ANS. Thank you all for inviting me here and for this uh, opportunity to introduce my work on the Iranian South Asian borderlands in late antiquity. It's been such a pleasure in the last couple of years to be working with the ANS. Uh, specifically, of course, I want to thank Andrew, uh, who's just been a delight to work with, and Oliver Hoover, uh, who really brought this project to fruition. Uh, there's so many other people to thank, uh, Vivek Gupta, who actually got the ball rolling, and you know, so on and so forth. Uh, my new book, In the Treasure Room of the Sakura King, Votive Coinage from Gandharan Shrines, was released about, what is it, 10 days or two weeks ago? It's uh, right, hot off the press. It looks at newly discovered coins, seals, and related artifacts to reinterpret the history and the iconographic landscape of what is today Pakistan and Afghanistan from about the 6th to the 11th centuries. This is an absolutely exciting and critical half millennium of South and Central Asian history, which actually witnessed a transition from Buddhism and an array of local Iranian cults to Brahminism to Islam, but which is more or less absent from the history books. Names of most of the dynasties in this period are unknown to, uh, to even, even historians working on the area. Our story takes place in a lush valley within the Sakra Peak in Northwestern Pakistan, in the tribal areas towards the Afghan border, where there's a vast limestone cave temple, part of an ancient Hindu sacred complex. For over 700 years, about the fourth to the 12th centuries, this cluster of shrines produced hundreds of varieties of their own coinage, issued as religious offerings for pilgrims, which is a unique case in the broader Iranian world and across Central and South Asia, with certain parallels that we'll go into. These were bizarre, minuscule copper coins featuring eclectic combinations of Iranian, Greco-Roman, Indic, and Islamic iconography. These coins practically blur the boundaries between coins as monetary instruments, as political proclamations or propaganda, and vernacular folk art, and provide a window into what may have actually been an ecclesiastic administration. And for want of a better term, I use this with a, you know, big quotation marks, we can call it a shrine state, with varying degrees of autonomy throughout its lifetime. Now, Although seemingly insignificant, they're absolutely minuscule, what you're looking at in front of you. Um, and they're notoriously difficult to make sense of. These tiny coins can overturn our understandings of cultural and artistic exchange, of the way in which religious symbols emerged and transformed in one of the most fascinating examples of regional transculturation. They feature five different scripts, Pahlavi or Middle Persian, Bactrian Greek, um, the Indic uh, Brahmi and Sharada scripts, and Kufic Arabic. Iranian symbols are <clears throat> and sacred animals are juxtaposed with Vishnu's conch, with swastikas and tridents. Here you have in front of you uh, the chakra, 
uh, the, the wheel, the ubiquitous auspicious symbol, the swastika. This, the third is this composite creature which carries divine charisma, Farna or Fare Izadi in Persian. Vishnu's conch, we've got three other Far or charisma carriers from the broader Iranian tradition. We've got at the bottom right-hand side, Adur or Atir, who is the human representation of the Zoroastrian holy flame. We find lots and lots of different Zoroastrian fire altars, plus astrological and devotional symbols. So here are four very, very distinct fire altars of many, and then a sequence of symbols of which some of them you may recognize uh, as astrological symbols. We have ancient Greek portraits and motifs, uh, in this case, like Athena in the derivative coin at the bottom. The, the top is a uh, drachma of Menander, and then we find a derivative coin minted about six centuries later from this, this region. In one case, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian shows up, but now holding Shiva's trident. So what we see on the right is the local currency, and then uh, more sort of devotional or votive gold artifacts that these may have actually been derived from. In yet another series, older Hindu and Iranian motifs appear next to coins inscribed with Allah and Muhammad, messenger of God. This book relates the remarkable story of these coins and the sacred sites that made them, and introduces the obscured history of the most neglected yet formative years of Pakistan and Afghanistan's history. I tell the story of four great kingdoms, the names of the first three all but forgotten, the Nezak, the Turk Shahi, the Hindu Shahi, and the Ghaznavids. Great states of the Iranian borderlands ruling over the legendary kingdoms known as Zabul, which is around Arakosia, around um, modern day Kandahar, Kabul, and Gandhara, which is now in northern Pakistan, spilling into eastern Afghanistan. Today, I'll walk you through the site, its history, and its coins to give you a sense of why these coins are so important and entirely unexpected for scholars familiar with Iran or Central or South Asia. And at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna provide one vignette from the book, which shows how coins can alter our conceptions of cultural or civilizational encounter. Now let's begin by situating us in this world of the Afghanistan-Pakistan frontier and sharing a story which I love to tell. Between today's Kabul and Islamabad is the ancient country of Gandhara, which features the Khaybar Pass, through which travelers and armies from Iran and Central Asia entered India for millennia. Um, the Hindu Kush mountain range and several of the great Buddhist centers of learning, such as Peshawar, Swat, and Taxila. This is where Buddhism came of age. As a crossroads of civilization, Gandhara has been a blending point for the Indic, Turkic, and Iranian worlds, a veritable petri dish for observing the interactions of faiths and cultures. Now, I'm going to demonstrate this through a few coins circulating in and around Gandhara and Kabul. Now, just to keep this in mind, these are not coins that are native to this particular site. They have been found within the sites that I'm working on, but these are the broader coins in circulation. And then these end up being derivatives of these coins end up finding their way into the, uh, in fact, uh, are then sort of derived by mint masters working within a sequence of sites that I'm looking at. So to begin, this is an eighth century trilingual coin of a king who styles himself Khorasan Tegin Shah. Khorasan roughly means of the East. Um, it combines with the Turkish military title Tegin and the Persian title Shah or King. The reverse, that facing image is Adur, which is a human representation of the sacred fire in Zoroastrian traditions. But the King depicted on this coin followed a blend of Hinduism and Buddhism. And his crown, if you can possibly see it on this, uh, this particular specimen, features Shiva's tridents, wings and streamers derived from Persian Sasanian models and a head of a lion at the top. Now, incidentally, the dynasty to which this king belonged to, who ruled over much of Afghanistan and Pakistan, 
called the Turk Shahis, also founded the city of Kabul, as we know it today, and held off Arab invasions for almost 150 years. So while all of the adjacent lands are conquered in the seventh and the eighth and the early part of the ninth centuries, um, this particular empire, this, this rather sort of lobed fragmented empire ends up holding off the Arab advance. And it's a fascinating story I tell in the book of Arab armies repeatedly coming in, taking the big cities in Afghanistan, unable to hold them for a few years at a time. Now this next coin, um, this in fact is a map of the Turkshahi kingdom. So it spreads really from the borders of Iran all the way into Northern, um, in fact, a chunk of Afghanistan into Northern Pakistan. Now this bilingual coin belongs to a forgotten sixth century kingdom spanning Zabul, Kabul and Gandhara. We have a Sasanian Persian style bust but with a mustache and cranial deformation, which is a result of a Central Asian practice of head binding at birth. But this king, notice, wears a crown of a bull's head. And this, believe it or not, may be one of the several historical figures who inspired the character of the hero on horseback, Rustam, in the Persian epic Book of Kings, the Shahnameh, who in the Book of Kings is incidentally a king of Zabul, uh, connected to the ruling household of Kabul, fighting on the Iranian borderlands, and like this gentleman here, also wears a bullhead's crown. So either he inspired part of Rustam or Rustam inspired him. Now, our story takes place in Gandhara, specifically the Kashmir Shmast, a cave temple hidden in the Sakra Peak, a four hour hike from the nearest village. The Kashmir Shmast is a series of natural limestone caves artificially expanded over time. Shmast actually means cave in Pashto, and Kashmir has nothing to do with Kashmir. Uh, the, according to legend, either it's the, the, the fact that it's verdant is reminiscent of Kashmir, or some say that the, the longest of the caves within this cave complex actually used to stretch hundreds of miles into the land of Kashmir, eastward. The Kashmir Shmas Cave Temple has been known to be a source of antiquities for over a century. Uh, in the 19th century, the Archaeological Survey of India reported on it briefly. A few elaborately carved wooden pieces were carried off to the British Museum, but the area was mostly accessible because it lay on the fringes of British rule. However, in the past, local treasure hunters would make forays into the caves and focus on recovering only silver and gold coins lots of them. Now the silver and gold coinage as is typical of the region consisted of scarce but mostly known specimens that would have circulated in roughly the zone from Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India from the third to the 12th centuries, like the two which I shared. Ironically, the tiny copper coins from the cave were almost entirely ignored, regarded as scrap, and were by and large left behind. The actual treasures of the Sakra region were these seemingly unimpressive copper coins, which unlike the other specimens from the region were purely local productions, meant for circulation only within a five to 10 kilometer radius of the cave temple. These were the only artifacts that attested to the autonomy of a region through a remarkably long period, unaffected by the various invasions which swept through. These coins provide clues into the political, economic, and religious, and cultural landscape of this region. The earliest of the local specimens begins under the Kidarites, who had migrated from Central Asia in about the fourth century, and they go on until Muslim Ghaznavid rule in the 12th century, perhaps a little bit into the, uh, the Delhi Sultanate period. Now, my story actually begins in the summer of 2000. When traveling through the region, a local historian requested my assistance in identifying a lot of very unusual coins that were found in Pakistan's Northwest Frontier Province. This lot was made up of hundreds of little copper coins. Some of them were actually tiny versions of well-known regional coins. Others featured, like you can see over here. So for example, the, the regional coins would be these Kedarite and uh, Al Khan Han drachmas, and then these tiny little uh, creatures are the local products that come out of this region. 
Um, others actually featured a host of bizarre images completely outside the scope of all publications to date. And this is the first coin that I encountered, which actually got me hooked. This unassuming and docile duck carries in its beak the Iranian symbols of royal charisma, Skwarna or Far, which is a beaded necklace and streamers. And for those familiar with Sasanian currency, you will notice these sort of emerging from the back of, of headbands or, or diadems or on the back of, an, of a beaded necklace. And these are generally carried by far more elaborate mythical animals. And here we just have a duck. The reverse bears a Sanskrit devotional phrase, Jayati Dharma, or the victorious law. In the margins, we find the lunar bull symbol, which, uh, which as it was referred to by, by Robert Goebel, um, which is a royal mark of the notorious white Huns, who ruled over much of this region in the fifth century. And this gives us a chronolog chronological marker. This is, this is the dating point. This coin comfortably blending what we may call Iranian Hanik and Indic elements is the earliest dated depiction of this charisma bearing duck, which later appears in Central Asian palace murals. Uh, anyone who's been to Samarkand will, will know the ambassador's mural. There's actually a figure that has a robe on with this duck, repeated patterns of this duck visible. And it's also found in fabrics as far as China. Now probing deeper, we were able to trace this and the other coins back to the great cave temple, the Kashmir Shmast. Um, the cave temple is stuff of legend. Uh, my first trip was in 2008. We drove to the mountain village of Rustam, which happens to share the name of the legendary hero of the Shah Name. And from here, we hiked up the mountains for about three and a half hours. At a certain stage, we encountered an ancient pathway with small meditation cells carved into the rock. The pathways took us up to a mountain and then split in three. So one path actually goes to ruins on top of the peak. One goes down into the valley, which boasts a well. And in fact, several people will claim that the, the well cures tuberculosis. And the well, in fact, may have been the very reason why this site became a sacred site so many years ago. Um, and the third path, which comes to the right, which we followed, winds along the side of the mountain up to an ancient staircase on the side of the cliff which culminates in the 20 meter high mouth of the Great Cave. Um, it's believed to be haunted, naturally, so we were compelled to offer protective prayers before entering the first great chamber, which extends about 60 meters. So after 60 meters, um, so you near the end of this, this first chamber and, and you hear the sound of running water, which as you ascend into the second chamber in what used to be a, a set of stairs, uh, you discover that it's the, actually the uh, running water is the sound of hundreds of bats. And then wading through guano, a staircase ascends to the right into the last spectacular chamber about where about 30 meters above in this sort of domed chamber, there's an artificial hole in the roof which casts light upon two small shrines. They're sort of cubicle shrines with typical Gandharan diaper masonry and, and this light sort of shines on these two. And then you've got smaller passages towards the left, which then lead downward into the narrower caves, which according to legend used to go all the way to Kashmir. Now, over the last 15 years, I've been working with local farmers, antiquarians and pastoralists and have collected Im images of about 2000 specimens from the shrines with about 300 distinct varieties covering the 700 year period. They feature legends in five scripts and unrecorded images, stylistic elements, and new symbols. Based on a um, donation plaque, and in fact, a couple of donation plaques that Harry Falk has worked on and Chinese travel narratives, we know that the cave temple was in a strategic location. Now keep in mind, this is not, a, this is not an urban area. This is far away from the urban centers of Pushkalavati, uh, Purushapura, Udabhandapura, Kabul, um, but it is an important route. If you were traveling, if you happen to be traveling from Kabul to Taxila, the great college town of the ancient world, which is now north of Islamabad, and you wanted to go north, this is from this town of Shabazgari, which features the famous edicts of Ashoka. Uh, and you went northwards towards the, the sacred mountain kingdom of Udiana, uh, which is now called Swat, which is a important destination for Buddhists. 
So you would encounter the Sakura Mountains and the shrines along the way. The cave temple was the seat of a certain goddess Bhima Devi, identified as the wife of Shiva. Several other shrines in the area were dedicated to other deities, but the coins produced in the various shrines feature a range of Middle Iranian deities, Greek deities, and images associated with Vishnu, Shiva, and as we saw the legends Allah and Muhammad, which of course you know, break down our conceptions of, of sort of placing these shrines into certain demarcated categories um, as we know them sort of in the post Puranic world. Xuanzang, a Chinese monk who had been to the site in the seventh century tells us that the cave temple featured a, an idol which was made of blue stone and this idol was self wrought. Pilgrims he said visited from faraway countries. And he says that with seven days of fasting and meditation you could actually see Bhima in her form. This fourth century gold medallion on the book cover may well be a representation of Bhima or perhaps another local female deity. She shows up again and again on artifacts from the region and on tiny copper coins and seals from the site. And she holds a lotus flower and an ear of grain. Now, although the portraiture is typically what we'd call Iranian following Sasanian conventions, the ultimate image recalls the Greek city goddess Taiki, in fact, also Demeter, which then travels to Gandhara and later transforms into the Middle Iranian goddess called Artoksho, goddess of wealth, and also into a demon goddess called Hariti, the one who used to eat children, was later reformed by Lord Buddha. And later, this image transforms into the Hindu Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth. The inner scrolling that you see around the bust appears in contemporary Hindu temple doorways and the wreath-like border shows up in Roman medallions. So how do these local coins work? What's going on here? Why were they actually manufactured? First, it's worth pointing out again that the local monetary system of the Sakhar region is highly unusual for Central and South Asia and Iran. Nowhere else do we find so many different kinds of coins produced for such limited circulation within a cluster of sacred sites. Now, one of the interventions that this book makes is theorizing a category of votage verna votive vernacular coinage. Coins generally serve three purposes, among others, of course, as tools for political propaganda, to enable economic transactions, and representing civic or some form of local identity. Now, seen as a collective, it becomes clear that the Sakura coins fulfill none of these three functions. In fact, to a certain degree, they, some of them fill these functions, but as a collective, they simply don't. Rather, they serve a primarily devotional purpose as temple offerings, with pilgrims buying these coins, then offering them at different shrines within the complex. In this study, I consider how and why images were deployed and the meanings or lack thereof behind repurposed iconography. Now, in general, with a bimetallic or trimetallic currency system, silver coins, gold coins were often struck at official mints and they facilitate long distance trade, while copper coinage like ours produced by more private mints, I say this in quotes because we really don't have any documentation from the period, um, these local private mints could actually be one room cottage operations and they were primarily meant for local transactions. The Sakra shrine coinage sometimes follows the pattern of two to four gram silver coins of regional rulers, but with um, a little twist. The temple moneyers employed dynastic symbols and portraits, which were found on the larger currency, along with new eclectic portraits, titles, names, symbols. Some names that make absolutely no sense because the, the small flan actually sometimes allows only for, for two or three letters. This indicates that while the coins were issued independently for use in the Sakura region, the local temple authorities somewhat acknowledged their overlords. There was some relationship going on here who may have actually conferred the right of coinage to the temple mint. This relationship certainly changed over time, which is another concern of the study. How this local economy and monetary system relate to the larger states that govern the region? Where is the state in this local story? And coins can give us hints into the shifting hierarchical relationship between a shrine administration and the larger state, 
periods of later and uh, lesser and greater autonomy. In some cases, they may, in fact, they most likely imported die engravers from the big official mints. So let's say there's a dynastic turnover and a monetary reorganization, then perhaps a, a mint master would have been sent over to, to help come up with new dies. But other times we've got jewelers who are sitting in the temple complex who seem to be doing whatever came to their mind. So why are these coins so important? The main reason is that the seven to 800 year period in which these coins was issued is a veritable dark age for the history of the Iranian borderlands. We have meager sources in the form of Chinese travel accounts and administrative documents and Arabic and Persian chronicles. But in all cases, the names of the rulers and the dynasties are often absent or garbled beyond recognition. So coins are amongst the most reliable sources for political history. And this local coinage represents a gold mine in unraveling the numismatic and political history of the period. As most recent finds of coinage of late antiquity, particularly those unearthed in Afghanistan, lack provenance data, it's difficult to assign any variety to a specific city, to a state, or to a geography. We simply don't know where they're coming from. And with the Sakra copper coins, we know this. We know that whatever inscriptions or images that are found on them may not have been native to, but were certainly circulating in the Kabul Valley and Gandhara in Northwestern Pakistan. So as you can imagine, there are a host of historical questions which this find provides insights into, and, and I'm really looking forward to more and more scholars, in fact, from different walks of life working on this particular assemblage. Now, most of the questions actually relate to obscure dynasties. I don't wanna lose everyone here. So I wanted to share an element of my work that addresses some critical assumptions regarding early Muslim Hindu encounters under the Ghaznavid dynasty, which actually continue to inform South Asian communalist politics even today. So this addresses a really relevant modern question. So for those who aren't familiar, what is all of this about? The Ghaznavids a thousand years ago were one of the first great Muslim Persian dynasties. Um, I use Persian in quotes. They were based in modern day Afghanistan and the kings were ethnically Turks. It's under this dynasty, however, that Persian develops into a high literary language under their patronage. And it's this dynasty that also commissions the great Persian Book of Kings. Now, in the beginning of the 11th century, the King Mahmud crossed into Gandhara, where our cave temple is located, defeated the local ruling Hindu dynasty, who are called the Shahs of Ohind or the Hindu Shahis, and made the first lasting conquest of North India by a Muslim ruler. Now, Mahmud's invasion is not a random historical moment. It was actually employed as a critical catalyst in James Mill's bifurcation of Indian history into a Hindu and Muslim period. This is done in the late 1700s, this idea that there's a sort of self-standing Hindu period and then Muslim period and never the twain shall meet and the idea of civilizational clash, which then was sort of bought whole hog by everyone living in this region. So for British colonial historians and modern day South Asians, this actually ends up being the first clash of civilizations, Muslim and Hindu, a proof of the irreconcilability of two separate peoples and religious traditions, which depending on what side you are is either a great tragedy or the heroic triumph of Islam over Hinduism. Popular understandings dictate that this King Mahmud desecrated temples of India during his campaign as a matter of religious policy one by one. But the Sakra coins tell a different story. Let's start by asking a simple question. Now, when Mahmud invaded, he came through the Khyber Pass, which you'll see on the left. Um, did he encounter the Sakra sites and the Kashmir Shmast? Uh, the short answer is most certainly. In the early thousands, Mahmud followed the main highway that we talked about, traveled from Kabul to Peshawar to the Indus River. We know also based on archeological evidence and in fact, a, a, a mosque inscription in Swat that he got to Swat, he occupied Swat to the north, which means he certainly must have taken the northward road and encountered and established his rule over the Sakra sites. The old chronicles provide vivid descriptions of Mahmud's expeditions against certain key Hindu pilgrimage centers in North India. Now, while such primary sources narrate the destruction of prominent temples, 
They don't talk about what happened to the vast majority of Hindu sacred sites, particularly those in areas that did not challenge the sovereignty of the new Muslim rulers. After all, Mahmud had a, a very famous Hindu general, so something else must have been going on. Now, consequently, because of, of what these chronicles say, the bulk of scholarship on the Ghaznavid since the British colonial period has assumed Mahmud's iconoclasm was a matter of policy. Wherever he went, he found a temple knocked down. And as I mentioned, it's understood that with him, this existential clash of civilizations began. So the prevailing image of Mahmud as this unwavering iconoclast would suggest that the cave temple and the other holy sites of the Sakra Peak should have suffered a similar fate as the temples in the Chronicles. But not only have lots of Ghaznavid and later coins been found in the cave temple and its environs, but coins bearing Arabic legends referring to the Ghaznavid kings were minted by the temple maniers in the same manner as all of the other votive copper issues, in other words, as temple offerings. So this find illuminates aspects of Ghaznavid administrative practices and policies that are absent from the conquest narratives. Here you can see some of the coins feature older motifs of the earlier Hindu kings, like a lion advancing to the right, but one side is replaced by Muhammad, messenger of God. Another type features cosmological symbols um, with presumably Hindu or Shaiva meanings, but the other side features the word Allah. You can see the transition here from earlier Sakura coins uh, from before the invasion. In fact, there's a whole sequence of different uh, coin series, which then have at a certain stage sort of shift into Arabic legends or, or, or iconography at, at a, a particular juncture, which presumably corresponds with the Ghaznavid arrival. Um, some coins bear full Quranic formulae in the names of the new Muslim kings, but all are part of the local cave temple issues. Now, all of this indicates that the temple maniers produce coins with Arabic inscriptions, and that these coins that we may roughly call Islamic were being used by Hindu pilgrims. Now, without getting into details, the implications of these finds are substantial. We can infer that the Ghaznavids incorporated the cave temple into their administrative and revenue generating apparatus perhaps even through a state decree which ensured, like other political authorities in earlier centuries, that some portion of the revenues of the temple would now be given to the new Muslim state, just like in the past to other states who would have occupied this region. Most probably the Ghaznavids would have supplied dye engravers who worked with the local temple artists to include Arabic legends on some of the coins, along with a host of Hindu and Iranian devotional symbols. So this indicates that a critical moment of encounter between Persian Muslim empires and Hindu populations, sacred sites and states was far more complex than assumed through narratives of civilizational clash. It's a critical piece of material culture evidence that supports alternative theories of cultural exchange. Now, this is one of the many larger historical questions that are illuminated through these tiny coins. And ultimately, what we really require now is to bring together historians, numismatists, specialists of Iranian and Hindu theology and ritual, art historians, and archaeologists to try to make sense of these little coins, which far more often pose more questions than they actually answer. And I will stop here. I, I did have one question, just you know, speaking out of ignorance, and maybe other folks um, have a similar question. Uh, but when you're talking about the charisma or the uh, or the far, what what exactly do you mean by that? What is what does it mean in that context? Um, this is an idea that um, that charisma is, uh, let's say, well, this it comes from kingship actually. That that kingship is is actually given by divine right. And divine right is actually transferred in the form of generally a, a creature. And it's, it could be a ram, it could be forms of, in fact, birds are very, very common. Um, most common creature here is the Seymour or the Senmur, uh, which is a kind of, it's a fantastical figure that reappears in, um, in Persian literature. And this creature actually carries the, the royal charisma um, from the, 
divine into the the king and the king um himself then is uh, um manifest that charisma and when at a certain stage the king is no longer able to to hold on to the balance between um uh various subjects and actually maintain justice then that charisma is no longer um uh, can no longer be held by the king and then the charisma is taken away um so it the idea forms in the context of kingship, but then all of the symbols end up being incorporated into different um, uh, into different sort of religious context. Uh, it's it's actually very uh, one of the most common ones is that this this charisma bearing animal in the context of of Persian poetry becomes a kind of symbol of Sufism and self realization. So they end up taking very, very different forms and certainly also enter into the into Buddhist vocabulary. I Can I ask a question? Um, hey, Waleed, Peter Tompa, nice to Hi, see you. Hi, nice to see you again. Yeah, um, I was wondering if there was any parallels to this type of votive coinage in uh, the Hindu religion today or other religions that you're aware of where they use things that are basically votive coins, similarly to what was done here. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, in fact, we have to you know, constantly make parallels because of the lack of documentary evidence in this particular case. There are um, several uh, parallels that we see from you know, outside of this context. Uh, there are biblical examples from the, the Temple of Jerusalem. So pilgrims visiting require acceptable currency but you've got biblical prohibitions against graven images of foreign rulers. So you end up using shekels of Tyre, which become this sort of uh, currency that is acceptable within the sacred grounds. Uh, much later, you also have a case under the Crusaders where special tokens are actually issued, which feature an image of the Al-Aqsa Mosque that was believed to be the Temple of Solomon. And these were again used by um, those visiting the Temple Mount. We have several of these sort of minuscule copper coins in the Roman context as well that seem to be manufactured specifically as temple offerings. And then, you know, we've got the, the idea of tokens, of course, continues on to the modern day. We've got you know, communion tokens for the Lord's Supper in, in the US context as well. We've got certain moments in the history of Islam in which tokens were issued, I think under the Rasulids of Yemen, um, just for circulation within uh, the sacred precinct at Mecca. Now, this sort of on the outside context, um, inside uh, sort of, let's say, within the Hindu tradition, these are most comparable, but a little bit different from Ramatankas or temple tokens, which Michael Michener has written about extensively. So these are, in fact, some of them actually bear images that are very similar to what we find on the, um, on the Sakura coins. This tradition begins by about the 10th century, and these are coins that are generally issued by, they could be issued by temple moneyers, they could be issued by jewelers. In fact, if you go to any bazaar in South Asia today, you're going to find Ramatankas from the 19th and 20th century that are available, some with Muslim uh, legends or Arabic legends as well. So these are generally used for ritual purposes. They are kept at temples or they are used in homes um, uh, for household worship. You can pour them over idols um, along with other offerings such as you know, milk, curds, or ghee. Uh, so there's an actual process of bathing idols with these particular coins. And in general, in this case, they are handled um, when they're being used within the holy sanctuaries. They're handled only by priests. Now here we're finding something of a, a bit of a combination between the Ramatanka tradition because most Ramatankas are actually uh, there for take home purposes. And you can actually purchase them you know, at jeweler stores, even if the if, even if the uh, the jeweler stall is not located within temple precincts. Um, and then you can use them. You know, you can use them for marriages and, and other rituals. Um, so, in this case, we're talking about something that generally stay that absolutely stays within the the sacred grounds, but something that may have actually been issued by jewelers akin to the Ramatanka tradition. Thank you very much. That's an interesting answer. Just one quick follow-up question. When were these first noticed? And I mean, maybe they were noticed 
well before they were publicized, but is when was the first date that there's any kind of publication about them? Uh, first date of publication is probably around 2002, I think. Um, it was very late. Yeah, it's very it's very late. Now, uh, if you look at at Robert Goebel's work um, on the uh, the Eastern Huns, uh, sorry, the the Eastern Iranian uh, regions and Hunnic coinage, there are several coins that actually fall into this category, but they're extremely scarce. And, and certainly they're not, it's not commensurate with, let's say the number of you know, silver coins that, that he, uh, corresponding silver coins that he may uh, um, have uh, pictured. Um, my guess is that several of these um, spilled out at various stages and then were published. There are, I would say about four or five publications uh, prior to 2002, 2003, where these show up. And then after that, just we have a plethora of them, you know, across the board. Makes your book all the more important. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. I had a question. Um, Olid, great, great talk. Uh, always very uh, interested in hearing what you have to say. Likewise, uh, always I'm great to see you. Well, it's good to see you too. I'm wondering on the earlier coins that you probably weren't able to talk about as in such length. Uh, what evidence you find for like Buddhist images or Buddhist symbolism? Um, um, virtually none, except when it's shared, right? So you've got the Dharma Chakra, which appears there. Um, there are no novel images of the Buddha that are appearing here. So this mm -hmm. is this is. Uh, I mean, again, it, it makes sense because you have uh, you know what Chuanzang would refer to as the heretical traditions that are emerging in the in the fourth, fifth, sixth century, and this is emerging within the Shakta tradition. So this is within the um, the Supreme Goddess, the Mahalakshmi tradition. Um, mm -hmm. So these sites are coming up at, at about the time when Buddhism is on the decline in Gandhara. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, does, it does make sense. Now there is definitely iconography that's being used um, in previous coins that then finds its way in uh, like, let's say of the broader you know, Buddhist period. Again, I say this in quotes, um, but then you, you'll also, um, You'll also note that prior to this, there are very few coins that are coming out of Gandhara and the Kabul Valley and Arakosia that actually like this have distinct Buddhist iconography. So you know, you've got mm -hmm. the um, um that, that supposed guild coinage from Bushkalavati and Taxila. Uh, you have images of the Buddha in Kanishka's coins, but apart from that, you have an array of you know, Ardoksho shows up, for example, a lot more often than you'll have. And you'll have images of the Buddha in uh, in coinage in the region. So in a sense, it's not. Um, I know R uh, Robert Bracy and Joe Crib have written about this. A sort of disconnect between um, between uh, the public performance and between the actual sort of physical sacred space and what we're seeing on the coinage. And uh, you know they have a, a very exceptional debate about this relating to the Kushan period. Uh, but again, short answer is no, uh, not particularly. Oh, okay. Thank you. There's also a question in the chat. Is there any evidence these bronzes circulated and were used for transactions? In other words, are they coins or tokens? Um, no, no. Um, there is absolutely no evidence beyond actually what we see right now. Um, so the, uh, there are a couple of points, and in fact, I think those who are specialists in, in uh, the development of Hindu theology will have more to say on this, but um, there is a question of whether sacramental objects can actually be used for commercial purposes. Uh, anyone who's familiar will, will know what I'm referring to in, in far greater detail. Uh, so there is a, a chance that if something is to be handled by priests, it cannot be handled by, for other transactions. Then again, of course, we're, we're also seeing you know, Arabic legends here in Muhammad, messenger of God. So what may be happening here is a, a little bit different from what's expected. Uh, the only thing to say here is that these are not major Mart towns. Now it is possible like the temple of, of Garibnath um, in North India, that there may have been a trade or a fair that takes place there. And these coins also actually function as local currency for use in some sort of a commercial fair. But uh, these are not the, the major commercial entrepôts of Gandhara. And again, it's the, the clustering of these coins around certain sacred sites, which implies that, the, um, that they are mostly for, or I would say entirely for devotional use and then you know, spilling over into other purposes. Of course, nothing is uh, 
has a sort of unitary purpose. Um, and I guess the, the one comment to be made in that is if we're talking about you know, economic acceptance and coins as, uh, as primarily commercial or economic tools, um, one thing we got to consider is seriality, right? So everyone expects coins to look a certain way and therefore this is a particular kind of you know, token that is useful in transactions because we know it's round and we know it's about yay big and we know that it features something familiar. And now here we're talking about 300 different varieties. We're talking about you know, images that simply would not even be associated with currency that are coming up here. There's a lot of sigillographic imagery that shows up here. There's in fact some rare, um, uh, clearly, um, I would say, um, sort of symbolic, uh, um, perhaps what would you call it, a um, kind of uh, um, word that I'm looking for is almost like a Nazrana uh, type pieces that that are issued in the uh, in gold in the Hindu Shahi period, uh, whose iconography also appears here. And these are not coins that anyone would have seen unless they're part of a of a local ruling. Um, elite. So, you know, by virtue of that, and again, all of these things are suggestions, right? I mean, we, the more and more evidence that comes out, the more and more we'll be able to, to assess uh, what's going on here. But all indications are that these coins are not built for acceptance as monetary in instruments, and they are certainly, there's no seriality, except in certain sort of subcategories of these, these particular coins. I also just want to say that, of course, as Andrew said at the beginning, um, that this that your book is available for purchase, and I have a copy from the ANS's uh, library here. So if anyone is looking to to read more about this, we do have uh, there there are um, copies available of this, and I'll put the, the link in the the chat here um, for information on how to purchase it, and of course. All ANS members have uh, you get thirty percent off um, all ANS publications. So that's uh, there there in the chat, as sort of the plug both for the book and for more information on the topic. Jill, you have a question. You're muted. muted. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you for this very interesting um, uh, presentation. I had, a, I had a couple of questions or comments. Um, I, obviously, when when you're coming from a European perspective, and I'm, I'm thinking about the votive deposit of, of Greek and, and Roman coins, we think some degree of selection um, in some of the vo uh, votive deposits, but people tend, on average, you using coins that could circulate. So. Um, the question I would, I would have at that point is, are we saying these types are only found there because we didn't find them elsewhere, which may have to do with a lack of uh, careful site excavations in the region compared to, let's say, a European Near East or North African situation? So it, it's a question. Um, or do we have good evidence that, you know, even with excavations and, and, and careful uh, surveys. Um, actually, these coins are there and, and no one else, uh, nowhere, sorry, nowhere else. So that's that's um, my first question. My second question is: so if these coins are designed just to be offered, I'm questioning or what the process by which the faithful would acquire them. Mm -hmm. You you would expect some kind of transaction. I mean, if a temple. Yeah leaves for, um, can use these transactions or these 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 gift uh as a way to leave i mean the you know the, the priest i mean the, the god servants need to eat and 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 leave so um you need to expect something are you going to bring like food offerings and 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 buying these coins and then would be given to the god i mean there must be some process behind these uh, these offerings otherwise it would be useless um, Gilles, uh, may I? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you brought up actually um, several really important points, and um, some of them I'm going to offer answer to. Some of them will be tentative answers. I'd love to discuss with you further. Okay, so the the first is how would these coins have worked? Now, one can only guess that there is some you know, seniorage fee going on here, right? So there's a lot a 
a large quantity of larger coins in circulation, copper, silver, and gold that are found within these particular complexes, uh, which would imply that people are bringing in currency, whether it's uh, you know in their pockets, whether there is trade going on there, and that these coins then, similar to what's presumably happening in the Temple of Jerusalem context or with the Rasulid, uh, Rasulid dinars in the Meccan context, is that you bring your own coins and your own um, uh, specie, and then you exchange it, and then the exchange rate, of course, will be favorable uh, to the, uh, there will be some seniorage fee, and then that fee, of course, uh, is <clears throat> distributed whether to the poor or to the temple functionaries. So it's, that's presumably what's happening here. Now, again, you find something similar happening with the, uh, with, you know, Ramatankas as well. Obviously, there is a, the, the cost of these tokens uh, far exceeds the actual um, cost of the metal. Ramatankas are generally, even in the sort of 10th to especially 18th, 19th, 20th century contexts. Um, uh, let me actually just qualify this. I'm referring specifically to the 19th and 20th century context as they sort of continue onwards. Uh, we find that they're not of pure silver. So there are debased and there's there's uh, generally silver coated or, um, or so something along those lines. So this is presumably what's happening on that front. Um, the second was this uh, this issue of um, of sites and and whether they are available or found elsewhere. And uh, it's true, absolutely true. I mean, there is is an enormous amount of work to be done in this in this region. However, interest in coins has really been continuing, uh, you know, from the sort of uh, days of, of Charles Mason onwards. Uh, so you do have you know flourishing markets uh, and you know at various stages uh, very active uh, you know archaeological work that's being done in Gandhara, in fact, up to date. Uh, so um, it is fair to say, um, with some degree of certainty, that there is a particular area where these are coming from. And um, you should also note that just urban sprawl and um, agriculture has obviously infring like infringed upon a lot of these sites. Uh, and there's been, uh, in fact, mining and agriculture. So. Uh, a lot of sites have, uh, we have a fairly good sense of where these things are found and where they're, and where they're coming from. And uh, uh, although, you know, suffice it to say that there is certainly more room for this. So one of the, um, uh, this is one of the core questions that I was looking at in the course of my research is that um, if we can delineate a, um, uh, a sphere uh, how far are they coming from and in what kind of quantities? And um, it becomes, I mean, I've been working with now, I think 30, 35, 40 uh, different people who I've been, uh, um, who I've been uh, in touch with and who've shared images with me and have been sort of very open about sharing data. Um, it is crystal clear that there is a very particular area of about 10 to 15 kilometers where they're emerging from and that the vast quantity of them were coming from the great cave and then about mostly about seven shrine sites in the vicinity and then they kind of taper off as you go further and further from that um they are not found in the two in the two major cities uh in the vicinity that is uh purushapura and udabandapura uh, they have not been reported in jarsadda and uh, neither in any of the excavations in swat um Truthfully, there have been like a handful that have been found in SWAT, but we're talking about two to three specimens versus several thousand. Um, so, uh, Gilles, is that the, uh, is, are there any other questions that were? Uh, um, Thank you. Uh, no, that's okay. That's... okay, great. All right. Thank you. Hi, Walid. I have a Hi. comment and a question. Um, uh, first of all, great presentation. I very much enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing the book. Um, one comment I had, you emphasize, you know, 300 varieties, but you don't emphasize that that's over six to 700 years. Yeah. And so at any one point in time, it could have been that only one type of variety or few varieties were sort of in... Uh, circulation within the sacred sites, and uh, and then you know they they turn over as the political uh, situation changes. Um, uh, so that's my comment. 
Um, my question is, um, and this is a question about the usefulness of your book. Have you provided concordance with Nassim Khan's uh, book on the Kashmir Smas coins and also with uh, Klaus von der Vex? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, this, the second question is much easier to answer. Yes, uh, I have provided concordance with-, with Okay, with thank them. goodness for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, Pankaj, I also, I also uh, owe you some images. I'm well, well aware of that. So hold okay. me to it, please. I've been collecting them for you. Okay. Um, so the, the first comment is a very important one. And um, you will see actually when you're, um, uh, when uh, you get hold of the book that um, the, uh, yes, truthfully all 300 are not circulating side by side. But what's fascinating is that our, our corpus of, let's say the Hindu Shahi period, our corpus of Hindu Shahi coins, known varieties goes up by about fourfold uh, just of the coins of the Sakura region. Kedarite, you've seen. Uh, you've seen from the Vandravech and the uh, and the Nasim Khan volumes that we are now dealing with, you know, hundreds of varieties that we never saw, uh, you know, apart from the twenty odd sort of common varieties that that were circulating in uh, Kabul and and I'm sorry, into between Kabul and uh, and Gandhara. Um, so uh, at each given moment, we are yes, certainly not seeing necessarily three hundred circulating, but we are seeing a few things that are different. We are seeing, um, and this is actually, I'm sure we'll be able to discuss this in, in depth. It's, it's always exciting to discuss this with you. Um, we're seeing, first of all, far more experimentation, almost bold experimentation, which seems to sort of, in most cases, and, and you'll see this, um, we find there are certainly multiple mints that are operational in these sites. And there's certainly some mints that seem to be more aligned with the, let's say, provincial, provi the provincial or official mints. And again, I say that with, with quotes, where the legends are closely aligned, where the iconography is closely aligned. And then you have other productions that are markedly different. I mean, the flans are different, the production is different, the type of legends is different. Um, some are of course garbled, which we can call you know, imitations in the, in the crude sense of the term. Um, so we're seeing a lot more bold experimentation, especially in these sort of secondary and tertiary sites. Uh, things that we really, really would not expect. So Kedarite three-quarter portraits showing up in the Hindu Shahi period, but conforming to Hindu Shahi artistic standards, that is to the sort of flattened kind of um, uh, the, uh, the outlined forms that characterize the, the Hindu Shahi period. Uh, we see images again, like you saw Justinian you know, holding the trident that are, we simply don't see those types of images showing up in coins or, we see it at certain stages and then new coin types develop. So on one hand, there are far more that are coming out. And on the other hand, we're seeing far more bold experimentation, which gives us a sense again of the relative connection of this partic these particular sites to the metropolis uh, and what type of relationships would have existed. And to a certain degree, a, a group of these, of these um, um, let's say one room workshops or one stall workshops would have been quite independent from what was happening in, let's say, uh, Ghazni or, or Bost or Kabul or Udabandapura, which are the four regional capitals in this right. period. Right. Um, actually, what you just said uh, suggests uh, another question. And that is that we, uh, or at least I am guilty of this, that I'm thinking of the Kashmir Smas as kind of one big site. And I'm wondering whether you have any data on specific, you know, locating specific finds and specific quote unquote hordes. In other yeah. words, groups of coins that have been found together uh, in one place. Uh, do you have any information on that? I, I, I do, I do. I mean, I can, I can share this with you later on. And again, yeah. it's, it's patchy. Most of these are not found as hordes. Most of these are found as individual specimens, but we do have a very good sense of, uh, you know, in many cases, what's being found, you know, on the Babusai side or the, or the Rustam or the, or the uh, Birsai side. Um, so um, um, yes, uh, there are a few hordes that actually have been recorded. Uh, in fact, one from the Kedarite period that I would love to share with you because you worked on these coins as well. Uh, but we'll discuss this later cool, on. Cool, yeah. Yeah. 
Are you back in the U.S., by the way? I am, I am. Okay. As, well, as of we, a few days ago, yeah. yeah. We should talk soon. Okay. We absolutely should. Okay. Well, that brings us to two o'clock. Do we have any more quick questions or? Uh, there's there's one in the chat, Emma. Um, are these collected or exclusively held by museums? Um, these are collected and all of the um, all of the publications to date have been from private collections. Uh, including the Bashara Museum ones, as well as the Von Trevetsch ones. And this is the, uh, the unfortunate case that we're dealing with. Thank you so much, much appreciated. And, you know, good to see friends uh, and uh, looking forward to uh, to seeing the book in flesh. Congrats. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it might be outside your front door right now. <laughs> go, go check, go check. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.